Hi, I'm Carol Hornpen. I'm president of Crew Greater Philadelphia, and um, welcome to today's session, um, Crew 2020 Benchmark Study, Gender and Diversity in Commercial Real Estate. Um, next slide. Um, first, let me just thank um, our sponsors. Crew is lucky to have wonderful, wonderful sponsors. Um, we um, have our affiliate sponsors, Noel Rethink Innovations, Hayworth, Chrysler Miller, Servpro Bucks, um, Workspace Interior by Office Depot, our groundbreaker sponsors, Equus Capital Partners, Greyhawk, JL Architects, NB5 Block and Clark, Old Forge Builders and Langen. Our high rise sponsors are Century Engineering, Brookfield Properties, Land Services, Fulton Bank, Archer, Archer, I used to know it as Archer Griner, so Archer, um, Irwin and Layden, NFI, Wick Fisher White, Fox Rothschild, White and Williams, Kimlin Horn, the Harmon Group, Donald Apparato, and Advantage Sports and Fitness, our skyscraper, sky, skyscraper partners, Brandywine Realty Trust, Delworth Paxson, Capson, um, Herman Miller, WSF, WSFS Bank, KSS, First American Title Spectrum, Target and our premier sponsors, Bercadia, Clemens Construction Company, and Fidelity National Title. So without them, none of this happens. So thank you very much for that sponsorship and support of Crew Greater Philadelphia. Next slide. And today's program would not be possible without Crew Network. So Crew Network, um, and uh, every five years, uh, does a benchmark study. They started these in um, 2005. So you can see they're all available on the Crew Network website. So 2005, 2010, 2015, and now 2020. The 2020 study, which we did review a few months back, um, focused on gender and diversity in commercial real estate, and really was time drilling down in on diversity and um, equity and inclusion. Um, so Gina Lavery, who is one of our presenters today, uh, presented at that time with Celia Hahn. So Celia um, and um, Gina worked um, with the team that created the study. And Gina is a senior vice president and principal at eConsult Solutions. She's also a creator, creator, greater, greater Philadelphia crew member. She leads the firm's economic development practice, is involved with their real estate and urban planning practices. She also used to work for Jones Lang LaSalle, where she was responsible for market research. Um, she's from Philadelphia, um, and she belongs also to ULI and Lambda Alpha. International Philadelphia, in addition to crew. And our special guest today, um, who is not a crew member, but really I think we will all gain lots of insight from today, is Robin Wilson Tolbert. Robin is a former um, GlaxoSmithKline HR professional, where she was there for 17 years and led one of their teams, one of their HR teams, um, and really launched her career as a career coach. So she brings over 25 years of human resource experience, a real expertise in career coaching, um, and owns her own coaching practice, RWT Coaching LLC. Um, together, Robin and Gina will walk you through the study quickly and then launch immediately into sort of how this study can be leveraged for your sort of thinking about your own personal career and how you can make a difference both in your individual career and the career of others, especially thinking about questions of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and I just also want to add before they start, um, our chapter um, through our, actually our, uh, our Incoming president, um, who will start in 2022, Kathy Fahey, has been leading our team, the diversity advocacy group, to really focus on how Crew Greater Philadelphia can address issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion as a group founded around um, the um, leveraging and sort of making sure that women are included in uh, commercial real estate, 
um, this study as well as our chapter is really focusing on not only women, but how we can include other diverse voices in our chapter and in our profession. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Gina and Robin and thank you very much for attending today's session. All right, well, thanks, Carol, for that introduction. Um, you know, and as we get started, I just want to invite everybody to introduce themselves um, in the chat. You know, you put your name, uh, company, or role within crew. Um, and, you know, since we're, we want to make this morning uh, pretty engaging, you know, we have some, some questions, some, some interactive components later on. Just want to make sure we get to know everybody and get the chat going. Um, so I'll provide a really brief overview of the 2020 benchmark study. Uh, if you joined us back in February, you would have already heard some of these stats. So I'm gonna, uh, I'm not gonna go over them too for too long. Uh, if you do want to learn more about the study, the, the the 2020 benchmark study is is online on the Crew Network's website. So you know, here's uh, just an overview of the study respondents from this last uh, round, around 29. 100 uh, commercial real estate professionals, uh, primarily women responded to this survey. Um, so you can go to the next slide. And consistent with the last three studies, the 2020 study finds a substantial compensation gap between women and men. So overall, the difference in total average earnings, which includes salaries, bonuses, and commission commissions combined is 34%, which is nearly an 11% increase from 2015. Um, I should have said um, at the outset of this um, that the, uh, the 2020 um, benchmark study was done, the surveying was done before uh, the pandemic um, really uh, affected people's uh, employment, um, salaries, um, and work situations. So all of this, so keep in mind that all of this could be um, exacerbated by, um, by the pandemic in, in, in the last year. Um, so other findings re regarding overall compens the overall compensation gap, um, the study showed that uh, among respondents, women earn 10% less than men in base salaries, and they, and they earn 56% less in commission and bonuses. Um, this gap widens among women who are Black, Hispanic, or Latinx, and Asian compared to white women. Next slide. Another... Um, facet that we delved into with the, with the benchmark study was work-life balance, uh, which was identified as an important factor for both men and women. So while women's satisfaction with work-life balance uh, increased only slightly this year, men have become um, more likely to report being very satisfied with work-life balance in the last three benchmark studies. Um, again, this is uh, pre-pandemic um, data but does show kind of like the difference, the different patterns between men and women's experience in, in the workforce and, and their experiences with balancing their, their home lives um, in association with it. On um, the next slide, we look a little bit at job enjoyment, um, which continues to be the most important factor for both men and women. Um, for women, the top four most important factors have not changed since 2015. Um, and in 2020, both men and women say that the respect of their coworkers is the most important factor in their career satisfaction. Um, new to this year's top five lists for women's career satisfaction was, was working in a team-oriented environment at number four, um, and, and time with family tied with um, job enjoyment at number five. So, and then for, for men, uh, disposable income made the top five in, in 2020, replacing being a, a decision maker from uh, the 2015 list. Now, Robin, I know that you had pointed out to me, you know, when we were, we were preparing for this presentation, like you pointed out some interesting patterns here. I wonder if you have any, uh, any kind of like thoughts on that. Oh, absolutely. And thank you for asking. It's great to be here today, everyone. Uh, I look at this slide and then the next slide coming up as sort of mindset slides. So the others were data around what's actually happening. To me, this sort of pulled back the curtain to reveal um, some of the mindsets that go on and the differences between men and women. And, um, you know, basically what we think is important uh, has an impact on how we show up and how we put ourselves forward and in the world and at work, 
right? And so when you think about it and you look at this, for women, importance is maximizing earning potential. Um, for men, it's not only in the top five maximizing earning potential, but also being a decision maker. And what happens when people are decision makers? They usually make more money, right? Um, and, and so these things are important and uh, men seem to be predisposed to lead with that. And similarly with satisfaction. So disposable income doesn't even show up on the top five for women here. You put all that together and you do get uh, a flavor for the difference in mindsets. Yeah, thank you for that, Robin. I think I think that was really, uh, and you know, I don't think that it's necessarily all the time that that um, it isn't a factor of importance or satisfaction Absolutely. as much as maybe um, women are maybe less comfortable responding to that, or maybe you know you, you can only if you can only pick five five things as your top five, it, it might be number six. I absolutely agree. <clears throat> Um, and then I'll, I'll go to the next slide to talk a little bit more about a, a related data point. Um, so I wanted to share this in context of our of of what Robin will be will be talking about in just a minute on barriers to success in commercial real estate. Um, so the top five self-reported barriers to success have not changed for women since 2015, although the rankings have of the top three have reshuffled a little bit uh, with the lack of uh, company mentors or sponsors dropping down from first to third place. Uh, for men, interestingly, um, a lack of promotion opportunities has risen back into the top as it was um, in 2010. Um, but they also identified um, this wrong or poor choice of employer as one of the reasons uh, that's one of the barriers to their success in the industry. And, and Robin, I know that you um, you had pointed that out to me as well when we were preparing. Yeah, it's similar mindset that, that men do consider that perhaps they're in either the wrong job or the wrong company. And when people uh, have that as a possibility, then you know they, they are predisposed to think about, well, what else is out there? Um, and to your point, it's not everyone all the time, but it does come up in the top five for men here. And it's, it doesn't show up on, the, on you know, the hit list for women, as it were. Yeah, thank you. So I think, you know, that's that's a really brief overview of what we presented back in February, which um, um, I think that you can you can find more on 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 the Crew Network's website on regarding the both the survey and, and the benchmark study. Um, but I'll turn it over to Robin now to talk a little bit about with this data in mind, with these findings in mind, like how can um, we collectively, how can we individually um, think about ref, um, um, empower ourselves to to in, to do better. Great. So now you've seen the data, and what can you do uh, today? As promised, we'll focus on personal development. It's all about you. Uh, the, our three main topics today are going to be around self advocacy, so becoming your own advocate and. Uh, managing your own limiting beliefs, uh, talking comp with your boss on how to lay the groundwork for compensation conversations, and also playing on a bigger stage. So how can you help increase uh, diversity and inclusion while increasing your own visibility? Uh, well, of course, I've got to start with the disclaimers. As Carol mentioned, my background is in HR, leadership and career coaching. I am not an employment lawyer. So today we're not gonna cover any of that. If you really feel like um, you have a case for discrimination around your workplace, there are several outlets from talking to your manager, your HR department, to filing an EEOC complaint or even hiring a lawyer. Um, also, even just joining um, some of these associations like crew that are working on behalf of some of these issues is also um, a great place to start. But I won't be uh, getting into anything related to the legal aspects of it, okay? Um, and I also want to sort of set the stage uh, that 
we just saw those mindset slides and I know this is a really um, engaged group of people and you've probably read a lot of books and articles about how women have been socialized and um, in our society uh, versus men, you know, we know men tend to be socialized as hunters, gatherers, competitors, uh, protectors, and women more that nurturing, collaborative sort of um, disposition. And, um, you know, that's, it's true uh, to some extent, um, not everyone, it's a generalization, but in our society, we do see it play out often and we saw it play it out, played out in the um, slides that we just looked at. Uh, but today, as a leadership and career coach, my focus is on action. And what I see is that what we know does not always translate into uh, what we do. And so as a coach, I recommend and emphasize that we actually take actions. Um, we've seen studies about people come out of workshops or trainings and they're all hyped up about what they've learned. But we know that if you don't put it into action very quickly, that you can lose it. And I'm a firm believer in small actions to get to big goals. So how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, right? Okay, so just as a, as a starting point, we're here today, we're going to talk a lot about change. That's really the goal, one of the goals that we're working on, right? And so if we just zoom out and think about how change happens, uh, it really starts with um, external forces um, and that can be you know, globalization, laws, technology, culture, economics. And so when those global forces meet up with the C-suite of your organization and their forces, maybe product lifestyle, organizational strategies, mergers, labor supply, reputation, um, competition. And then that comes together with uh, our employee attitudes, right, and, de and demands and activism, that then brings about change and more sustainable change, right? And so today, the piece we're going to focus on is you. That's where, that's where we're going to play today. Now, I'd like to talk about what I consider building blocks to success before we dive into our three big talk topics. I think there are a few things that if we put in place, we're going to be really more successful. And one is accountability. So some of us uh, are really wired that we are self-motivated, we can set goals, we can set timelines, and we can reach those goals. However, um, I find that you take that to another level when you team up with an accountability partner or an accountability group, uh, and that can help you take it to the next level. So even if um, you are really hardwired to be an uh, action-oriented, goal-setting, goal-attaining person, um, you can still benefit from an accountability partner. And if you're someone who is less likely to uh, be really radical in your goal setting and um, achievement that an accountability partner really is an essential um, force. And that accountability partner can help you take those actions and get where you need to be. Some of the things you want to think about in an accountability partner is you want to find someone you trust, someone who understands what you're trying to achieve, and someone who supports you your goal, and can also be honest with you when you fail to meet those goals, which we all will um, on some level at some point, uh, and we'll need that extra oomph to get us over, the, over our goal line, right? So um, you want to think carefully about who you choose. Doesn't have to be someone in your business or industry, but um, it should be someone, as I said, who truly understands what you're trying to achieve, 
Okay. And I, I start with the accountability partner because that relationship is going to help you with these other things as we move along. So the next building block to success is accomplishments. And it's not less important, but um, your accountability partner will help you really amplify what your accomplishments are, okay? So um, a recommendation that I have is that you keep an ongoing list of your recent accomplishments, whether they're, um, you know, completed projects or milestones on your route to your project completions, and that you think about how can you talk about these accomplishments in a way that's engaging, short stories, conversation starters, right? Um, so you're going to need this list um, to, in your back pocket as we move forward and talk about some of the topics at hand. Uh, and why is your accountability a partner important in this? Because we're often able to see someone else's strengths more clearly than we can see our own. So you take those accomplishments, you pressure test them with your accountability partner, and your partner helps you um, really think on a larger scale, keep you from thinking small and, and really uh, holding yourself back. Um, just a, a quick story. I was um, coaching a young woman who was working in the Middle East and trying to come back to the U.S. to work. And, um, you know, our first session, she told me, oh, yeah, I, co I work on this team. I coordinate a project to, um, to build children's facilities in our refugee camps. Okay, it's a great job. Um, it sounds very interesting. In the next two or three sessions, I learned that she wasn't working on a team and coordinating the project. She had conceived of the project, written the grant. It, it's um, worked and designed the actual facilities, led a team of 15 people, speaks three language fluently, and had won a Fulbright scholarship. So when she first talked about what she did, it was a very different picture I coordinate a program to conceiving of and leading this huge effort, right? So the next thing we want to talk about is uh, allies. So just being able to advocate for yourself or having a manager in your corner isn't often enough when um, <clears throat> you're trying to really gain visibility and um, amplify your accomplishments. So Look at your network, your business network, people in your industry. Who are your current allies that you can continue to um, bring along with you? And who are the allies that you may want to cultivate in the future? And think about how you do that. Your list of accomplishments will help you with that um, as you're beginning to bring people in so they know more about you. And your accountability partner can help you think about who are the best people to consider. Okay. And remember, SMART goals, whatever goals you're setting, you want them to be specific, measurable, achievable, and time-bound. Okay, now we're going to pause for a moment, and we have a little poll. And we'd like to know how many of you <clears throat> have at least one accountability partner, have or had, uh, how many of you keep a running list of your accomplishments? And how many of you really think very deliberately about how to cultivate your um, allies, your group of allies? And this will just give a sense of where this group is, okay? Uh, we see people chiming in. So far, it looks like we have about about half, half the people having accountability partners. Maybe a little less than half uh, keeping lists of their accomplishments. Ah, looks like we have more than half who are deliberately cultivating their work allies. That's awesome. Well, that's great. This is with about 70, 75% um, having voted. <clears throat> um, great. Thank you all.
And I'm going to end the poll now. Let's share results. So you can see yourself where, where this group lands. Awesome. Okay, so um, before we move on, I thought this might be a good place also to see if there are any questions. Just a reminder to put questions in the chat if you have them. Okay, Tina, do you see it? I'll take, yeah, I'll take a co-presenter's privilege to ask you a question to start, Robin. Um, sure. So who, who should we be seeking out as our accountability partners? Like, is this like a coworker? Is it a friend? Is it somebody from crew? Like, how do you go about getting somebody to kind of be that, that person for you? Great question. I really think that um, it could be a friend. Um, coworkers are great. The thing that you really want to pay attention to is it's someone who's going to be in your corner, who's not going to be afraid to challenge you nicely, but still challenge you. Um, you know, if you continue to miss certain goals, what's going on and help you brainstorm. And someone, if they really need to understand what you're trying to accomplish um, and that you can keep some you can keep it going because that's the other thing is you want to set up regular meetings with that person and write those goals down, right? I have an accountability partner. She happens to live in Las Vegas. She's someone who started her business around the same time I did. We literally meet weekly, go over what we're trying to achieve. And um, I met her through a training program. I didn't know her prior to that. So it doesn't have to be someone that you're really close to but just you know similar goals and you want it to be reciprocal so both of you are, are working on something then you have a stake in each other's success okay thank you Gina all right so now we're going to dive into uh self-advocacy and um we'll we'll start with those building blocks and um, we're going to work on being our own best advocate. So you have your list of accomplishments, you've pressure tested them with your accountability partner, you're feeling really good about it. And you wanna think about the who, what, when, and even where to use these, right? Um, and so I'm calling them elevator pitches or elevator speeches. I'm sure most of you have heard about it. Um, you, you happen to find yourself on an elevator with your CEO um, and the time it takes to get to your floor, 30 seconds maybe. What do you want them to know about you that's gonna stick, right? Um, and this elevator speech uh, is, it's simple. It's small in terms of, you know, you're not going into a lot of depth, but it can carry a lot of impact. And most importantly, it can open up, it can be a conversation starter. So you get someone to uh, recognize you. And also once you've opened that door, it's usually easier for you to delve into the conversation. So that's why it's important where we start. So you know, you have your elevator pitch, uh, something with a hook, a short story, you're going to identify your audience. So who is that person? Is it someone you usually see in an elevator that you've been sort of intimidated by or reluctant to initiate a, a conversation? Or maybe it's just high, nice weather and you want to take it to the next step. Um, and who is it important? Who could help your career? Who do you admire in terms of how they uh, show up in the workplace? And then you want to pick your moments. So um, is it on the elevator? Is it in the parking lot? We're in um, virtual land right now. Is it during networking sessions as soon as you get on a Zoom call or you know, the few minutes as you're introducing yourself and breakout? And then think about, is it an informal setting or is it a formal setting? Informal, as we talked about, you know, elevator, parking lot, coffee, coffee room. 
formal thinking more specifically about certain types of meetings or performance uh, discussions, in which case, of course, um, you're going to move from an elevator pitch to something a little more um, that, that goes into more depth, perhaps, right? But overall, you want to think in terms of sharing a short story. Um, this often helps frame it. It keeps it industry interesting. Um, uh, sometimes we think about it as a hook, like what's going to get someone interested. Um, and focus on results and milestones, less about your actual process. I held, you know, uh, 30 meetings to do X, right? No, but you want to you want to talk about something that's really going to grab their attention. Oh, hey, we just got approval from the city on this big project and we're breaking ground you know, in the next, I don't know how much time, right? But you want to really get something uh, that's gonna spark someone's interest and perhaps even more conversation, okay? Um, let's see if there's anything else here. Yeah, so um, that's our elevator pitch and then of course, write it down and practice. And this again is where your accountability partner comes in because you have someone that you can role play with. You have someone that can give you feedback in the moment and practice is so important. You may not say it verbatim when you get in the session, but you feel, you feel more comfortable about it, okay? The other thing I wanted to mention before we get to um, questions in the chat is um, focus on talking about yourself. Uh, and what I mean by that is studies have shown that women and people of color often, because we tend to be more collaborative or socialized that way and all of that, we speak in terms of we, the team, right? And that's awesome that we give that credit to our teams and that we uh, acknowledge others. However, we're talking about self-advocacy and this is the time to talk about the I. You can mention your team, but this is the time to isolate what you do, what your role is. And if you get stuck in that, one of the things I suggest to people is to ask yourself, why does my role exist? Okay, um, so I know a lot of us do do a lot of work with teams, but we do have a specific role um, in that. And so it's really great for us to, to bring that forward. And then when we talk about uh, results, think in terms of numbers, dollars, percentages, and time. So when you're distilling what you do, um, think about, yes, I was able to save um, X dollars on this project or cycle time, or I was able to um, increase the revenue by X amount. So think in terms of, of that as well, okay? okay? Any questions so far? Now, one question that comes up a lot from some of my uh, clients is that sometimes they feel like they're bragging when um, they, they try to do this and that holds them back. Um, they feel like they're, you know, they're imposing on, on people and constantly just talking about themselves. Uh, and so one of the responses I have to that is, this is why we talk about doing it in a way that feels comfortable with you and practicing. Um, and I did have a situation where I recently picked up a cohort of um, new managers at a major corporation and they're high flyers, top talent. And so I'm coaching all of them. they are about half men and half women. And within the first session with all the men, they told me about all the fabulous work they're doing, how important they are, um, how important they are to the, to the work that they're doing and their accomplishments. And the women talked more about how hard they work. 
and one even commented on being a den mother. So you can see that, you know, there is a difference. And when I was talking to the men in that moment, I didn't feel like they were bragging to me. They just really understood what their value was and how to communicate that. Okay, any questions? All right, so now for the sticky wicket. Uh, let's talk about talking comp with your boss. Uh, and we'll start by talking uh, strategy. Um, and it's important to zoom out and think about um, the strategy uh, before you actually get to um, going in and having a chat about compensation. So first of all, I suggest that you schedule ongoing performance and development conversations with your manager. Uh, especially if you work for a larger corporation, you can't assume that, and they have a lot of direct reports, you can't assume that they really know all that you're accomplishing. So you want to make sure that this is a part of your routine. It can be quarterly, bi-monthly, whatever, but you want to make sure that you're talking about what it is you're achieving, um, how you're doing, uh, development conversations where they see your career going, where you want your career to go. Uh, and this is important because as you get to that actual compensation conversation, you don't want to be all of a sudden blindsided by this, some feedback or developmental areas that you weren't aware of that uh, sideline the conversation, right? And then you want to start early in the process. So you want to educate yourself on what are the uh, cycles related to compensation. Are there talent management discussions? Are there cost of living increases? Are there, is it bonuses and commissions? What is involved in that total compensation? And how does that process work? You don't want to make, wait till the decisions are made to say, oh, I wish, you know, I, I think I deserve more you want to get in early on that so that you can influence that. Uh, next is knowing your worth. Uh, and this crew study is a great foundation for that. Um, it's also important to get a sense of what's actually happening in your organization. So are there salary ranges published? Do you know what your colleagues are making? Um, it's, you know, some some cultures talk about it, others don't. So, you, you know, it is, I recognize that this is not, um, you know, you just wake up in the morning and you start asking everyone what they make. That's not how it works, but you um, sort of get a, a feel for the culture and, and what you can find out because all that information is going to be very important. And then prepare, um, you know, put it all together, figure out what you want uh, and prepare for your meeting. Now, the actual comp meeting, you're going to go in and you want to be confident. Remember, you've been talking about your performance and your development with your manager um, over time. And um, so certainly you will review your uh, recent accomplishments. One thing I want to mention about being confident is that it really is important to go in um, in a way that your manager understands that this is important to you. This is a serious conversation. So what I mean by that is no self-deprecating humor. Don't try to shroud it in, um, in humor or, or otherwise take away from the importance of the ask, okay? Um, and so you're gonna talk briefly about your recent accomplishments. This does not have to be a long meeting. Don't walk in with a PowerPoint deck of, you know, your life in this role. It, you don't need that. You, you've done that groundwork already. And then you want to have a specific request. It doesn't have to be a specific amount of money or anything like that, but you do not want to leave any doubt why you had that conversation with your manager. So is it that, you know, um, 
you're coming in to talk about when your next promotion might be. Um, you've done this work around salaries and you feel as though you deserve, based on your work, uh, a salary increase and you're hoping for X. Um, and or is it about incentive compensation, the bonuses you're getting or the commission you're getting? And here's also where um, in our strategy, in our ongoing performance and development conversations, hoping that you've had conversations around what your contribution is, what sorts of projects you're being assigned to or you volunteer for when it comes to um, levels of commission or bonus, right? Because not, not all types of projects, not all contributions are created equal. So you wanna make sure you're on the upside of that, okay? Um, and then finally, uh, well, first of all, you go in, you have this request. I think it's unreasonable to expect that your manager is gonna say, that you know what here's five percent right <laughs> um the, it's it's probably not going to happen that way uh they probably have to take it back to leadership um and uh so then it's on you to really ask them when should i follow up what are the next steps so that you you understand when you can expect to hear something okay and um then the next step is for you to be prepared, and this is part of the strategy too, for plan B, right? So if you're unable to, for whatever reason, get what you think you deserve, then, then what, okay? And this is not about giving your leadership team an ultimatum. This is a conversation you're having with yourself. What are your options, okay? Is it that um, you're gonna talk further with your, manager and figure out, well, what do I need to do to get that promotion, that increase to be assigned to these more lucrative projects? Um, is it looking around your organization to see, can I apply to other um, jobs? Are there other parts of the organization where I think I would be better suited and, and have my accomplishments recognized in a different way? Or is it time for me to get serious about looking outside of the organization? Radical, I know, but um, sometimes that is where, uh, that, that is a course you need to take. Um, so that's, that's how we would look at that overall approach to um, talk, talking compensation um, with your boss. Uh, So, uh, do we have any questions in the chat, Gina? Um, we do have one question and it's kind of um, taking a step back from even asking from, from comp and more about navigating, and I, I think this is an okay time to, to ask it, navigating like a challenging work environment. So you're in a situation where it's really toxic or, or like uncomfortable for you. How do you navigate that with kind of like in terms of interpersonal relationships with, you know, maybe your managers or your colleagues? Yeah. So this is, you know, this actually does come under the guise of uh, self-advocacy and learning to speak up for yourself. And I'm not saying this to say it's easy, it is challenging. This is where having a, a partner to role play conversations with helps. Um, it often helps if you're having a challenging issue with a coworker to always start by talking to that coworker, letting them know what it is that is um, giving you agita, right? That's getting in the way of that relationship and always trying to work it out at that level first. I should always be the first step. So if there's conflict with a coworker, conflict with your manager to really try and um, address that. And obviously, well, not obviously, but often it's best to find a quiet time pull the person aside, not when they're harried, running off to meetings or whatever, and have that conversation, reflect on what happened and be as specific as possible because that's, that's what helps and not wait for things to mount. Um, so that tends to be um, the best 
first approach. And if that uh, does not help, you might look towards um, an HR professional to uh, brainstorm with. And if it gets really bad, obviously, they may need to intervene. But hopefully, you can work um, to make changes yourself. If it's a complete culture that really is toxic and oppressive, then, you know, think back to our mindset slide where the men talked about this could be the wrong or poor um, company that they're, that they're in. It may, if it doesn't align to your values, then do some of that work and start to think about what are your next steps. Anything else, Gina? No, I think I think Rob, and that's really really helpful. I know from my own experience. Um, you know, I was in a work environment that I didn't necessarily love, and it was you know it took a while to. I was fortunate enough that I could had some time to you know look around and and kind of choose when to to exit. I guess the question is like, how do you maybe um, frame that either when you're leaving that you know leaving that situation with the people or like when you're or when you're kind of trying to seek your seek a new job opportunity how are you how, how do you communicate that with maybe a prospective employer that you're when you're looking for something now yeah i think that's a great question so if it's a prospective employer you don't want to go down the avenue of talking about a toxic uh, work environment i think you're looking for uh you know new new developmental opportunities and um, however, you should always think of an interview as a two-way street, right? So they're interviewing you, but you're also interviewing them in a way that you can get a sense of that culture so you're not going from the fire pan into the fire. <laughs> and then in yeah, terms of <laughs> what you leave behind, you don't want to build, uh, burn any bridges, the world's way too small, but if they have exit interviews, then I think that's a great time to share what you're seeing. And again, back to our accountability partner, role play with them, how you might actually say that in a way that is seen as you're being helpful as opposed to grousing, right? So yeah. That, and, and I wonder if you could talk any more about that point you made about like going from, you know, how to suss out like from when you're kind of talking with a new employer, like making sure that your values align. Carol just asked this question in the chat as well, like how to discern uh, the like values of a, of a company when you're, when you're seeking new opportunities. Yeah. So um, there are some great questions you can ask um, around what's the management style of your direct manager. If that's the person you're interviewing with, describe your management style. How would you describe the corporate culture? Can you give me an example, right? Examples when you're in interviews, the interviewer loves to ask you for examples. Get, ask them for examples, right? And if it really is a great culture, people can't help but talk about it and get energized in that conversation. They really can't. And you can see that. And then that opens the door for you to ask more and different questions. You can ask about how do people get developed? Not when's my next, when's my first raise and when my, when's my next promotion? But what does career development look like here? Right, what are the expectations and that sort of thing? Um, those are some of the questions you can ask. And whatever it is, that one thing it was that was uh, bothering you, that was misaligned to your values at that, the job you're currently in, focus a question around that, but always from the positive. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's helpful. I'm gonna go back a little bit more to, so the, the, the uh, individual had who had the question about the tox, toxic uh, work environment and give a little bit more context and then we can see if mm -hmm. there's any other questions. Um, she says, so just for reference, the owner of the company had, seems to have, he has a volatile temper and the HR in this situation is, um, is, is the owner's wife. Um, so they're not really open to talking, um, and they'd like to, this person would like to leave, but is, um, kind of afraid to put in their notice for fear of, of retribution, which is, uh, uh, this might be yeah. a little, this might be more for the, the lawyer than for, for you, Robin. It, yeah, Bell. more, more for the lawyer in terms of retribution, but at the end of the day, um, I, 
it works to their benefit that, that you're afraid to leave, right? <laughs> but you would be surprised that the world is much bigger and different. And if you're feeling a toxic culture there, then other organizations are aware of how that company works um, and about how those people um, run their business. So I, I wouldn't be concerned about that. I would focus mostly on, on you and what you're after. And you'll find that there's a, a probably a whole new fabulous world outside of that if you take your first step, right? And, and try to keep things positive as you do it. I did want to point out a couple of questions that I get often um, about uh, having compensation conversations with your boss, one question I get is, should I use an external offer as leverage to talk about uh, getting a promotion or getting more money? Um, and uh, so that takes a lot of effort, right? You, you're going out there, you're looking, and then you're taking that back. And it really depends on you and how you feel about the organization and what you might be giving up or what you might be going to. So for me, I wonder if, if it takes me having to get another job for my company to offer me more money, um, am I going to have to do that the next time I feel like I'm deserving of another opportunity, right? Um, or it may be that, you know, someone, it, you came to you with this job offer, you weren't seeking it, but but it did spark questions. And that might be an opportunity to say, it seems like I am, um, you know, my job is worth more on the open market. Can we have this discussion? So it can work to your benefit, but if you've been butting uh, up against your manager about this and they've been no, 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 but now all of a sudden it's yes, I would, I would wonder about that. Um, and then others ask, when's the best time to negotiate? Obviously, when you're in a hiring situation, always ask for more money. Um, then you may not be able to get it, but it's the best time. You have the best opportunity. Or if you're, or if you're um, up for a promotion, that's often a good time where there may be some flexibility. Okay. Got a couple more questions now. Around. Okay. All right. Um, so one is... Um, if a greater compensation package um, was promised and not yet delivered, what is a nice way to approach um, bringing that conversation, uh, bring up that conversation again? There's no HR department here either. Okay. Well, um, I think the best way <laughs> is to be direct. So, who made the promise? And to actually go forward and say, you know, I've been here X amount of time. This was part of the package that we negotiated. Um, I'd really like to know when I can expect it. Okay. And again, if you're if you're getting pushback and all that for something that was promised to you, um, then you have a couple of recourses, right? You can go externally and find someone to help you navigate that. Um, or you can begin to look elsewhere and not feel guilty about it. So the term nice, um, I think I would replace with respectful. Um, because, you know, again, don't shroud this in anything but what it is. This was a promise. This was what we agreed upon. Um, I need an update and I need to know when I can expect it. Nothing wrong with that. Any? One more question when you're, um, see, um, so how would you go about gathering information about um, comparable pays for um, peers at your company? Yeah, so it really depends. Um, you know, some companies will ask you, oh, don't talk about your salary with other people. Well, they can't do that. I mean, they, they can ask you, but um, it's not against the law. So if you have good relationships with people that, that work uh, closely with you in similar jobs, um, you can broach the subject. The person may not tell you, but you can broach the subject. Um, and, and it can be, you know, I've been looking at this, um, this this crew benchmark survey and it's showing you know ranges and I'm like you know I'm not really in this range or I'm at the low end of this range you know where are you relative to that do you mind sharing with me 
Okay. Um, I know I, I worked, I supported uh, field sales at GlaxoSmithKline and the sales reps talked about their salaries to anyone that would listen, you know. So some cultures are just different about it. Um, but feel free to, but you, you know, all of this is, is relationship based too, right? It, it starts there. So building those relationships is key. Um, knowing that your co your colleague knows they can trust you and that you're willing to share your information if they share theirs, all of that helps with that. Um, but you'll find people are reluctant, um, but then there are others who'll gladly help you out because they'll they'll see it as helping themselves as well. You know, something else I find helpful just in that category is just finding out at um, comparable companies um, because one of the things that um, employers are looking at is not just like where like at their own pay but like you know it is is who's who else is attracting talent that I'm that I'm after so you know if you say and I've, I've done this um coached by uh, my partner who is really good at this stuff like um say like you know this is not a competitive salary. This is this was what I used with my with one of my first jobs. This is not a competitive salary for the work that I'm doing. You know, here's examples from other places that are similar for jobs that are similar, um, and that seemed that seemed to work when I when I did yep. that. That that's know your worth. That's an excellent example, Gina. The other thing is to think about total compensation. So it's not just your base salary, especially in your industry. There's bonus. There's commission. There are benefits. Um, maybe there's equity depending on your organization. So really thinking about the total package, okay? Um, and also flexibility. If, you know, remote working, we're doing that more and more. Um, how important is that sort of thing to you and your lifestyle or vacation? How important are these things for you? And does that offset um, any part of that compensation package. And those are equations, formulas you only you can, um, can think through for yourself personally, okay? So let's go to our last um, topic here, which is playing on a bigger stage. So we spent a lot of time talking about your development, what you can do to promote yourself and, and that. And now let's talk about how you can even impact your own company and your industry. And that's playing on a bigger stage, starting at the, at the most basic, which is helping to create that inclusive work environment. So we heard people talk about toxic work environments and whatnot. You know, you, you can have an impact on that um, by the way you show up, by what you tolerate you may find that you can change, even if it's only a microcosm, one, one department of the organization, um, there can be uh, changes. So being more inclusive at work, that can mean uh, you see women, people of color, new to the organization, um, introduce yourself, check in on them, offer to show them around, offer to be a mentor. If um, they're senior to you, ask their advice, ask them to mentor you, really um, lean in to this inclusivity, start an employee resource group, that's where, you know, there are affinity groups, groups of women, groups of people of color, that's assuming, of course, you have enough representation, <laughs> if you're on an island and it's only you, it may be a little more difficult, <laughs> but, um, you know, and, and it's through some of these bigger initiatives like employee resource groups that you can actually eat more easily begin to broach questions of pay equity, right? Um, or transparency in the commission or the bonus process, right? Because it gives you maybe a little more cover and you'll feel a little more comfortable. So this is some ways you play on a bigger stage and, and people can see you in these roles. Um, and then there's being a talent scout. So I love this picture, ask me what I do. You don't have to be a hiring manager. You can be an individual contributor and still be an awesome talent scout. You're out there everyone from your Starbucks barista to your ex-partner, you can talk to about what you do, what your company does, what you love about what you do, what you love about your company, when there are openings. They don't have to be your openings. Um, that 
you know, the industry and the organization is looking to bring in diverse talent. And so who do they know? You never know who knows anyone. If you think of all the people that pass through a Starbucks from CEOs to, um, you know, uh, administrative assistants, they probably know people who might be qualified. I do have a pet peeve. Oftentimes when people think about being talent scouts, you know, they go to universities and things like that, and they focus on interns or entry level roles. I think that's awesome, don't get me wrong, but I also know that CEOs move from one industry to another with the drop of the hat. So uh, there are transferable skills and I know everyone likes to think um, their industry is very specialized, but there are ways that people can transition from one industry to another very successfully at higher levels. So don't just limit yourselves to the entry um, level roles or internships. So, you know, you can be talking at your alma mater, local colleges and universities, sororities, religious institutions. A lot of these organizations have career related activities or panels or things like that. So you can get involved. Uh, next is being active in associations like CRU um, and any other industry association. So being a member, yes, but taking on some sort of an active role that puts you in front of people. Um, all of this raises, it not only helps uh, in terms of bringing people in and addressing those issues around diversity and inclusion and pay gaps and all that, but it also brings visibility to you. Your leaders are seeing you in a different way now. They're seeing you step out. Um, they're seeing what you bring to the table. And, um, you know, that can only help you in the short and long run. And then there's um, being active with social media. Now I do caveat this because um, a lot of companies have policies around what you can and cannot share under their name, what you know, collateral, what logos you use and all of that. So you really wanna understand what that is and stay within those boundaries. However, there are things you can do to raise your visibility as a professional in whatever you do right? So you may not, you don't even have to mention the specific project you're working on or the company that you work for, but you can talk about things like how you decided to enter into um, commercial real estate. What is your specific area of expertise? What is your superpower? What do you recommend to sharpen your skills in project management or development or whatever it is that's your, your area of expertise? You can write articles on LinkedIn, do videos on TikTok, whatever it is to raise your visibility. Um, and believe me, that gets you noticed as well. So you're focusing, you're, you're focusing within your organization as a recap. Um, you can act as a talent scout outside of your organization, active in associations in terms of showing leadership in these areas and building your credibility um, in terms of your professional, um, your professional standing through social media. Um, so those are the uh, areas in which you can play on a bigger stage and you don't need permission um, to do that, right? And at the end of the day, you're helping others and you're helping yourself. Okay. So we, are, we can go into breakout rooms, but I do wanna check first to see if we have any questions um, about this last bit before we go into um, our, our breakout rooms. Do you have anything on your... We, we good on that, Gina? I guess I'm seeing one question and Carol, not to put you on the spot, but is there something I, I, I'm trying to discern how to how to frame this for Rob and I wonder if you might um, might have anything to to add, add here. 
Oh, so I had said you had actually mentioned something about um, transferable skills. And I think a lot of times people aren't understanding sort of how to see themselves so linearly within their, their work and how they might um, identify what what they are, or is there some way for them to identify what's transferable and what's just sort of unique to my position? Yeah, yeah. So when I think about transferable skills, you're really, you're looking at that job posting um, and you're asking yourself first, what are they looking for and what do I have relative to that? So if it's, let's say it's project management, um, maybe you have a certification in project management, right? And depending on what type of project, it could be highly specialized. But generally speaking, if you are really well steeped, if that's your subject matter expertise, that could be something that's transferable. Um, if you are, if it's about um, business development, uh, you're trying to discern what can you learn versus what, um, what are the other skills that really propel you in, it, it, it propel you in that situation. Uh, let me give you a quick example. So, um, you know, worked at GSK, as I said, I supported the field sales team. Anyone that goes into sales has to go into deep training for several months in biology, disease state, and also the selling process, right? Um, so this is very spe uh, specialized. And uh, we're talking about, you know, respiratory, we're talking about vaccines, oncology. This is, this is deep scientific stuff because they're going to be talking with doctors, right? Well, one of our biggest areas to recruit people one of the companies we went to first to recruit people was Enterprise Car Rental. Why? Because Enterprise does a fabulous job in training people on how to, um, how to engage with customers, customer care, how to build that rapport, how to um, really think first about what the customer wants and meets their needs, right? And that was really important to us. That was more important than knowing um, initially about any specific disease state. We have, we can teach them all about that. And of course they have to have an aptitude test for that. And so there's some things we put in place first. But my point is who would think that a pharma company would look to a car rental company and say, you know what? They may, this may be ground, fertile ground for us to bring people into the organization. And I, I think about CEOs, you hear about it all the time. Someone was uh, leading General Motors before they went over to Apple or vice versa, whatever. Um, but you hear about that all the time because there are skills that transcend and at, at a certain level, you can pick up some of the other more technical aspects of it. Um, and Carol, I think you're, again, not to put you on the spot, but I think you're a great example of that um, before going to Clemens. So, um, so any other questions? Uh, Gina? No, I think that's it. All right. Well, let us go to um, our breakout rooms. Uh, we're ready for that now. That's and what we're time. going to ask would be that you pick a scribe, someone to take notes and a presenter to report out and that um, you'll choose one or two actions that you're gonna commit to from this section, from this session. And then what, you know, what's the most common action or mo most unique action that came out of your group and your biggest takeaway from the session?
Hello, everyone. Are we back in the room? All right. All right. So um, we'd love to hear from folks in terms of what, uh, let me go back to sharing my screen, sorry. What came out of your breakout sessions? Would anyone like to volunteer to tell us what came out of your, your breakout sessions? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll speak for our group. Great. Hi, everyone. Sorry, my video is not working. Um, we were talking um, about our biggest takeaways and um, some of the things that we need to, to do, obviously, um, you know, included things like, you know, better tracking of our actions. Um, we might be a little haphazard in doing it, um, or perhaps we're not tracking all of the things that are really pertinent to um, what we are trying to accomplish. So that was one thing that we, we spoke about. And then uh, most of us felt in our group that we really did need an accountability partner. And um, searching for that perfect partner. Is it someone that, um, you know, certainly you need to be comfortable with that individual. Um, certainly it's best practice to have someone who you are not in a professional alignment with, be it a, a you know, a, a manager or a direct report to you, um, someone that's more third party, if you will. So that was something that our group felt that each one of us probably needed um, a little bit more of or not more of a person, um, putting ourselves out there a bit more, getting rid of that icky feeling that Robin talked about. And then finally um, crafting and uh, polishing our elevator pitch uh, for each one of us in the group. Um, craft it well and then practice, practice, practice so that when the moment comes, you just uh, can go into, a, into the Netherlands and uh, tell the person all about yourself. So that's what we were talking about. All right, thank you, Maria. Anyone else? Anyone else have anything different they want to add? No. I think in our group, accountability partners were huge. Kathy, were you gonna go ahead? You can uh, share some. So I was just going to say, okay, awkward silence. Um, <laughs> so one of the things, there was a, uh, just the three of us in our room and we were talking about, yes, accountability partners, but also um, uh, um, I kind of delved into the whole diversity of like the pay parity thing and, you know, negotiating and asking and putting that ask forward. And, how do you figure out where people are that are in your industry as far as, you know, salary goes and that kind of thing. It's not like you walk up to a competitor and say, oh, hey, so how much do you make? Because I'm not sure I'm getting paid enough or that kind of thing. So that you can use the, have those numbers to use as, as a leverage. Because I, I feel sometimes it can be a little subjective, again, depending on what industry you're in and, and uh, your level of experience. Um, so accountability partners, and one of the things that we started, we talked a little bit about right before we popped back in was to having a group of uh, accountability partners, uh, maybe for the people in crew that are own their own businesses. Um, so that you've got that group of other women that are probably going through and or have gone through a lot of the same uh, pain points that they, you have gone through and how could we possibly facilitate that? Right. That's a great idea. It's an excellent idea. Yeah. Um, it looks like we have people dropping off. So I wonder if it's a good time to um, move forward. Uh, one quick suggestion is that for those of you who do have actions, maybe send yourself an email or write them down so that you can come back to them and remember them going forward. And I want to thank you all for your participation. I will turn it back to um, Donna. Donna, you're on mute. So sorry. Um, the famous, famous statement for this year, right? Um, thank you, Robin. Um, it, this was terrific. I want to just take a minute to talk about Crew Foundation. Um, so Crew Network Foundation funds four specific areas that directly support the advancement of women in commercial real estate globally. 
These areas are crucial to building a pipeline of women coming into the industry and supporting and advancing them throughout their careers. Our foundation um, college scholarships support future female leaders as they pursue university level education that will lead to careers in commercial real estate. The scholars receive $5,000 scholarships, paid summer internships, crew network student memberships, and convention registration. So to date, foundations awarded 171 scholarships totaling over a million dollars. And this year, an, an additional 25 scholarships will be awarded. Thanks to the support of the foundation, Crew Network is the world's leading producer of research on gender and diversity in commercial real estate. We're the sole organization tracking data and statistics to elevate discussion uh, and provide insights on improving gender equity and diversity in our industry. They've provided the white paper behind today's program and the one a few months ago. And then finally, Crew Careers and You Crew. These pro programs are the key way that we are building a pipeline of women. They're mission specific to what we stand for, and there's really no better way to educate students, faculty, and other educators about opportunities in commercial real estate. So I'm going to pass it off to Carol. Um, again, thank you for coming. Um, I, I can't thank Robin and Gina enough for the session. I, I think we learned a lot, I, I personally did. And um, I think as a group, uh, it gives us something to think about how we can support other members of Crew Greater Philadelphia. So with that, I'm gonna close. Thank you for coming. Thank you for taking the time to um, learn a little bit more about the benchmark study and how you can leverage it for yourself and make a difference in your own career. So thank you. Thank you all.